Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dean Anthony Davidson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out on, on such a um, not uh, conducive day weatherwise. I would like to thank uh, Andy, she just left the room, but and her team outside for putting this event together. And you came right now to hear from these people who are stars in the field, uh, a loyal supporter and good friend, Mary Ann Gilmartin. Thank you so much, who has been uh, featured at every one of our She Builds series, every event to date. And Michael Davidson. Davidson. I knew I should know that last name. Um, who is going to join it's us? <laughs> Fireside uh, chat. He was picked solely because of uh, his name. I'd like to also recognize the presence of a very close friend of mine, Ambassador Juan Avila from the, the Dominican Republic, Ambassador to the United Nations. Thank you for coming. Okay. I'm like, yes, wasn't I done? Okay. I think I'm not. Great to see you. So Marianne, just a little um, introduction because it's March. In 1911 was the first International Women's Day. It took all the way to 1911 to have an International Women's Day. In the late 70s and uh, officially in 1980 was the first Women's History Week, an entire week. And by 1987, Women's History Month was established, um, which we're celebrating this March. In those days, in the late 70s and early 80s, Dr. Gerda Lerner was a professor at Sarah Lawrence, also at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she was one of the great advocates that made this possible. One of her quotes in 1980, when uh, the Carter administration uh, past Women's History Week. Women's history is women's right, she said. It is an indispensable heritage from which we can draw pride, comfort, courage, and long range vision. Long range vision. Um, our good fortune with you is that we get to see your history unfolding in front of our very eyes, now and going forward. When you hear the word developer and you hear the word placemaker, which resonates more with the work you're doing today and going forward relative to where your career began? First of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's always great to come home. Um, that's a great question because I struggle with the word developer. I think it has, oops, that again. I could hear you perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> Testing, yes, better. Good morning, it's good to be here. It's happy, happy to come <laughs> home. So the word developer for me is, um, of course I know what it is because it's all I really know, it's my craft. But in reality, when people think about a developer, they conjure up um, caricatures, you know, people on the waterfront in New Jersey making deals and carrying on their business in ways that might not be um, with the highest integrity. And so um, I've kind of built my career trying to bump up against what people think of as a developer and, and think of it more as a placemaker. And if I use the word developer, I use civic developer, because at least in my work, uh, I believe that what we do as developers is contribute to civic life. And with that comes a great responsibility. So um, I'd love the word developer to mean all that I know that it is, which is if, if you shadowed a developer, uh, not, not, a, not a builder or somebody who throws buildings up between tax lots, but people who create place, change the skyline and the ground plane in cities. Um, it's, it's work that it would fascinate the average citizen to understand what it means to build something of lasting quality that impacts the lives of the communities in which it, it, it exists. And so not to get all heady about it, but it's a, it's a pretty big and daunting responsibility. And for many moons, developers rolled into to cities and places and communities and had their way. 
And that's not, that's not how it ought to be. And it's not how it really is anymore. But through my career, I've watched it evolve into a profession that should carry a deep sense of duty and responsibility. And my hope is that if I make a dent at all in the industry is to show uh, that level of gravitas associated with the business. And if we were to treat it that way, I think the quality uh, of the work and the impact the work has on communities would be much more meaningful and certainly would not be um, destructive by any means. Do you find that attracts, that definition, that ethos, that heart attracts different talent coming out of schools that want to do what you do? So in the 80s, um, when I became an accidental developer, and it was purely accidental, you know, I always think we should have a life plan, but we should be prepared to have our life plans upended because the idea that you can be, um, that you can approach life with some level of serendipity, even as it relates to your career, I think is really important. Some of us know what we want to be from the cradle. Others are like myself, we're just figuring it out. So I was on my way to law school and I um, was told by a Fordham professor to apply for a fellowship in New York City government. We're going back to the days of Ed Koch, his only recruitment tool, and it was a brilliant idea, was to stop young people from going into uh, the private sector and to have them stop over in public service and see if they liked it. And so these fellowships were called the Urban Fellows Program and um, you had to be matriculated in a graduate program. And I ended up winning two of them, one for the summer and one for the, um, the full academic year. And the advice they gave us was do something completely outside your nine dots, something that you were not thinking you were supposed to do. And again, I was on my way to law school. I was going to fight for the rights of juveniles in the justice system. And I interviewed with all the commissioners. And the amazing thing about this program is it was post-fiscal crisis. Not a single agency in the city had any money to hire anybody. And urban fellows were supposed to be kind of a cut above the rest. And so you, you actually sat with commissioners and you interviewed them. So I remember sitting with Ben Ward, the police commissioner, and he was supposed to tell me why I should work in his agency. And again, at 21, 22, it was, it was, it was um, uh, an outer body experience really to go through that. But the city was a dump. It was uh, just a, a really harsh place. And I, again, I went to school in the Bronx. I think I can say that, uh, you know, I, I know harsh, but this, the, the physical plant of the city was... Um, it was really awful. And so I went through all these agencies. I interviewed with so many different agencies, including things that I didn't know anything about. And I rolled into the Public Development Corporation and it was a corporation. And there was a president, not a commissioner. There was air conditioning, there was carpet. And it really felt grown up, very sophisticated. And when I went to all the agencies, I thought that um, really related to my calling, they would say things like, well, the peak temperature in the hallway is about 102 in the summer, but um, we've put a desk out there. We don't have any room for you in the, in the actual office. So you'll be in the hallway and we have the rodent problem under control. So we don't expect that you'll see anything that will absolutely freak you out. And I was like, okay. So I had these like the tale of two cities really inside of this, this agency that was a place where people who wanted to develop and build would flock. And I would tell you that being a real estate developer at that time, maybe a little more glamorous than a car salesman. I mean, it wasn't where the industry is today. I mean, now I meet people that literally they've curated their resumes from birth to be a real estate developer. But you must remember in the 80s, most of my colleagues flocked to the internet and it was the wild west. And I think real estate just was not an asset class where people thought they could um, find deep meaning. I'm, I'm being, I'm generalizing, but like it wasn't on anybody's radar in my circle of folks. And certainly being a developer, I'm not sure people even knew what it was. But over the time that I spent in the Economic Development Corporation, at the time it was called the Public Development Corporation, it was there that I realized that I had real estate in my veins, that this was something that was the best job on the planet. And it was um, able to work with people from all sorts of disciplines. And of course I met every major developer in New York City. And um, I think I got lucky in my career and hitting an industry at a time where, again, lots of young people weren't thinking about it. The people that were in it were families and dynasty real estate um, folks throughout New York City that were growing their family business. And, you know, it's really you are what you build. And so I just had this, this good fortune of hitting it in the late 80s, getting associated with um, a great public agency for which then I realized, wow, I could do exactly the same thing on the private side, work with exactly the same group of people, but do it in a capacity where I could pay back my debt and I could um, create a career for myself. And again, it was fortuitous. 
It was um, full of serendipity and it was not at all part of my plan. Let's talk about Ruby. Ruby. We're gonna pivot between the 20th and 21st centuries throughout this uh, fire season. Makes me realize how long I've been at it that we have to go between century, between <laughs> <laughs> decades. Sounds fancy, doesn't it? Just <laughs> nice to... So, so Ruby, Ruby the place, it's a new place, and Ruby the person, Ruby Bailey. Ruby Hyacinth Bailey, I love her middle name. Um, there's a story to be told there over the past three years uh, of courage, of your courage with what has been delivered with your team, but also Ruby Bailey's courage in the mid 20th century living in Harlem. Um, why Ruby? Of all the people, of all the heroines that could have been honored, the namesake for this new place that you've created, how did that come to fore? And how does Ruby the place evoke the essence of Ruby the person? That's a beautiful question. So I must start with what I wasn't prepared to do, mm -hmm. which is to name a building after one of my children. Because in the development world, if you run, if you run around New York City, there are lots of buildings with with names, and many times it's the name of someone's daughter, or wife, or uh, unfortunately, it's yeah, there are not a lot of men um, name. There are not a lot of women naming buildings after men. That's a little bit of the problem, I think. But anyway, I was pretty clear that I wasn't going to name the building after a family member. What I really wanted to do was to think about a way in which my company could um, do something a little bit different, a little bit. Um, more meaningful around the work we do. So when I started the company after being in a public company for 23 years, I wanted to prove that you could build beauty and create lasting value and deliver that long-term value creation proposition, not just to the partners and the investors, but to the communities in which we build. And that we would look something like the people we build for. Mm. Sounds really simple, but it's not, not in this business. It's usually the same old suspects, and uh, it's it's um, a group of people that's a, it's a club. And so um, for lots of reasons that we can talk about, I somehow managed my way through um, the industry without really being part of the club. And um, this building is the first MAG Partners building, which tells you a little bit about the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the five-year odyssey of getting a building. Again, it's a sizable building. It's 480 units. But this is a building that um, was born uh, out of the partnership I created. I bought my partners out. I took back 100% of my company, hmm. convinced my capital partners to proceed with the building during the pandemic when everyone once again was writing the obituary for New York City. And lenders did not want to lend on anything in New York City because nobody knew if anyone was coming back. So this building became a referendum of sorts, uh, a bet on New York City, for which I believed in it mightily, having built the New York Times building after 9-11 when we suddenly realized we had the upper floors, the Times had the base floors. Were upper floors ever going to be valuable in New York? Were people going to want to be in skyscrapers after 9-11? So recognizing a little bit about New York City's resiliency, I believed that the building would not only thrive, but that it would be the direct beneficiary of all the doubting Thomases, all the people who believed that um, we were all going to run out of the city and never come back again. So the buildings, of, it's, a, it's a very meaningful and um, poignant moment for me and, and the team to have brought this building to fruition and build it in the way that I said the company was created, which is to really create beauty. And I would say, uh, I don't want to overstate it, but it is a beautiful building. And beautiful in the sense that in this city, when you build multifamily, you can build commoditized, forgettable product and make money. And we see that all over. And we did not want to do that. So we have a mid-block two-tower scheme that feels like a sanctuary. It feels like a home. And it's competing with huts and yards and what it means to be in a tower of power. That works for some people, but this is a mid-block location in West Chelsea across from FIT, and um, there's really just a, a lot of um, beauty, grace, and nature as, as part of the, the design. And we held on to that and we fought for it, just like we fought for the pool on the roof. That's an outdoor pool, uh, which New York City developers don't do because you can't use it all year round, but it's, um, it's quite magical to be on that perch. When you're up 28 stories, um, it's different than being up 
you know, 55 because you're actually perched over this beautiful skyline. So I'm in love with the building. And then we come to this place where we're going to brand it. And we sat around and talked about it and decided that we have three multifamily buildings that we're rolling out. And um, we thought about who we are as a company and decided that maybe we should name it after historical women who have contributed to the life of the city. Mm. And um, we could create a brand around that. And um, so that was the idea. And then we started looking at women in the Garmin Center that made a difference and uh, had an impact. And we did, we did some research and we found Ruby Bailey. And again, she's a Jamaican woman um, from Harlem who was a beater, a master beater. And she had uh, a pretty illustrious career. And um, we thought this is um, really a winner. It's a winner. And we didn't want to call it the Ruby. We wanted it to be Ruby. So we approached the estate of Ruby and they were delighted. And um, we then said we wanted to do more than that. So we went to FIT across the street where she had studied and we started a scholarship in her name. And so again, in, in the spirit of how we ought to be doing things in our business, what if every developer took the time and the tender care and feeding of figuring out the place that they build in and the things that matter about that place and that community? And then that became part of the contribution. So we're not building just bricks and mortar, we're building places. And so in that spirit, you know, we, we voted as a team and Ruby won. And uh, when we build on the Upper East Side on 50th and 2nd Avenue, we will do the same deep dive into uh, great women. Here's the great thing is we know we're gonna find them because they're everywhere. <laughs> I am not at all concerned about finding really amazing women to, to honor in this quest. And then we have a sister building on 8th Avenue and 26th Street that will start this year. And that building will also be named after uh, an amazing woman that has some connection to West Chelsea. It's a beautiful answer. <laughs> Ruby Bailey fought for things uh, on, on multiple fronts. You fought for things. You fought for the existence of Ruby the Place. Back to the mid 20th century, Jane Jacobs fought for things too and was quite a visionary. Um, she had an impact on you, I think. What's the essence of Jane Jacobs here and now in the work you're doing going forward? What, is the, what are the vestiges of her brilliance that are alive and well within you? I think it begins with the life of a city. Um, I love cities. We're a country of cities. There are more people living in cities ever um, in the history of the world. And so I'm just uh, deeply devoted to city life, which she was as well, and the voice of the people, which I think she was as well. Mm -hmm. And she focused on the ground plane. And I think that you can walk throughout New York City and find places where somehow the, the ground plane was forgotten and the way in which uh, retail and life at the, at the ground plane interacts with, with people, places, and things. And so this is not an easy thing to get right. You know, you can pick a beautiful curtain wall, but when that building lands on the sidewalk, what does it feel like? And so I have just been fortunate enough to work with masters like Frank Geary and Renzo Piano, who really um, understand that um, the importance of that concept in city living and we spend a lot of time uh, talking about the way the building connects. If you look at the Geary Tower in Lower Manhattan, it's undulating steel. It's a masterpiece in the skyline. When it gets to the ground, it's brick because that's appropriate given the context and the area in which it's, it's built, right? Um, if you look at Ruby, it has a certain detail that, that really is evocative of the Garmin Center District and what it was like in textile and fabric and, um, just the, the, the variation on the, on the face of the building has a lot to do with the tactile nature of, of the business. And I think Jane Jacobs understood that. And of course, we always juxtapose her with Robert Moses and we, you know, we do that. And so if, if you ask me to pick a camp, much more in Jane Jacobs camp, although I have had the great fortune of working on projects that are so big that they're transformational in their nature. And um, you can imagine Robert Moses, you know, licking his chops and getting excited about uh, Barclays Center or, um, you know, what we're doing in Baltimore. But again, I think um, thinking big, and I, when I started the company, I didn't want to build uh, small infill lots. I, I could have, I mean, it's, it's a business, you can be very successful doing a, a collection of, of buildings, but I really want to create places. And so uh, I do want to be thought of um, in the realm of some of the bigger builders, not because of my ego, but because that's where the change is going to happen. So when I can um, beat out 
related um, for, for a project. You know, why is that important? Because it means that there were some factors involved that weren't just about the money. It was about the, the, the people who are actually doing the work. And that is not to say anything negative about related. It's just that we are a company of people. And um, every one of those people are in the company because they believe we're doing uh, important work. And we stay connected to that principle. And um, the culture inside the company is the most important thing that I protect. Because I'm really chief talent officer at this point. I'm trying to create uh, multi-generational talent that can carry the message forward. Um, and, and just try to transform the industry. We are the last frontier to be disrupted in real estate. You know, it's, it's still rather dinosauric in terms of how we do things. We're building buildings like our great grandfathers built them. And I can go through all the reasons why I think that that is, but there's a lot of room for disruption. And I think my role now is to create a team and a caliber of player that can be on the forefront of that disruption. And I just hope I'm around to watch it. Do you think that approach is a, an increasing chorus around the world to the, the, to the world's great cities, to the world's great urban centers? Um, do you find that there's a crescendo with regard to placemakers, wherever they may be, whatever language they speak, that are thinking and delivering the way you just articulated? So I think if we are really honest about it, New York is resting on its laurels. I mean, if you look around the world at great 21st century cities, whether you do it virtually or actually, mm -hmm. um, we have a lot more room for improvement, whether it's sustainability, resilience, architecture, uh, civic placemaking, the way that we treat our government physical plants, like how do we treat City Hall and how, you know, Mike Bloomberg was great for that, that really horrible physical plant I pointed out. By the time Mike Bloomberg was done, you know, the city he, he just invested his own money if he had to, to clean up our collective public act in terms of what it felt like to be part of um, civic life in New York City as, a, as it relates to a collection of buildings. But I think we're really behind the eight ball. I think that we need to take a hard look at um, how we're gonna compete as a 21st century city. So I think other places have a lot to, that we can glean from, to learn from. And I don't think necessarily that the industry as a whole in, in, a, in a global sense is still as diverse and as equitable as it ought to be. But if we just talk about um, New York City relative to other cities, the quality of life issues, uh, the quality of the built environment, our contribution to climate change and making sure that we're not the biggest offenders of the environment as, as builders and placemakers, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. When you think of Metro Tech, Pacific Park, 42nd Street, The Times, Ruby, these places and what it took to make them places amid communities. But now looking back when a project, when a place is finished, when a, when a project is complete, you move on to the next project. What are the things that keep the project, keep the place in accord with the vision that there was to build it? So, oh, I love that place, but it's not safe to get to that place. That's the problem for instance, were there lessons that you learned through those projects? Because those were the many gritty areas that you created places in. You know, who adopts those places, I suppose, when you move on to the next project, the, the community, public policy? So not to oversimplify, but people ask where the next great place is gonna be. And I always say, follow the food and the yeah. culture. So the people that are making art and that, that are um, contributing to the cultural life of a community are usually onto something. And then unfortunately, we have to make sure we don't go in and ruin it, make it ex so expensive that the pickle maker from Brooklyn has to move to Detroit. You know, that's, that's unfortunately uh, what I think we risk as, as placemakers. And so um, I do, I am proud of, of the fact that uh, I was able to go places where others didn't wanna go. And that includes 42nd Street and Times Square, right? Because um, at the time, I remember uh, there's an old theater called the Liberty Theater on 42nd Street. It's part of the Madame Tussauds yeah. complex there where AMC theaters are. And I used to market the space from 42nd Street um, because I, I insisted on building a marketing center in the back of this old historic public uh, theater. And it was a dark, dank, uh, cold uh, theater that needed a lot of love. And I set up a marketing center like right on stage so people could feel like when they met, they were actually on a Broadway stage. 
So uh, I don't know how everybody signed on to that, but that's what I was doing. But I would stand outside this theater on 42nd Street and I'd wait for tenants to come with their brokers to meet me. And literally police would come and say, excuse me, young lady, are you lost? And I would say, I know, I know, I know it seems like I might have a question or a gig, but I can assure you, my mother knows what I do. I go into this dark theater every day and I meet people <laughs> and I convince them that there's a future on 42nd Street. And um, obviously we were successful in building um, that amazing retail project. And then that really was a virtuous cycle that brought me to the table for the New York Times building, because at the time there were four developers that were Park Avenue developers. And um, mm. We were not on anybody's list to be be partnered to the New York Times. We were a, a Brooklyn developer, you know, gritty, scrappy. We built this um, this project, this retail project on Forty Second Street. But let's be honest, we're talking about Madame Tussauds, AMC. We rolled the Empire Theater down Forty Second Street to move it on the outside of the floor plan, and we made the Guinness World Book of Records because we actually put a historic theater on railroad tracks, and we rolled it down the street. And there was a time lapse, and we made the cover of the New York Times. We did it because there were two really important theaters next to each other, but there was no place to put the retail. And 8th Avenue was really scary. So we said if AMC theaters will allow us to move their lobby, which was this theater, to the end of 8th Avenue and 42nd, all the retailers in the middle would have less to worry about because they wouldn't be as close to the Port Authority. So in doing that, we, we just came up with this idea. And again, as a tribute to Forest City, if you could dream it and defend it, um, you know, we usually got approval to do it. And uh, it's, it was just a, a, uh, an incredible opportunity to roll through a couple of decades of, of building things that way um, and, um, and convincing really, as, as Bruce Ratner would say, uh, it's a public company, but it really was a family business drum, dressed up in a public company dress. And he would say all mistakes are relative. Huh. So it was really like getting around the dining room table and arguing about things about whether we should build things on 42nd Street or build a hotel on top of the project after we finished it. But it was great fun. And um, those, those were the salad days really, because now in the public markets, you really can't do the kind of development that, that we did at Far City. Mm -hmm. um, and that is part of the reason why I left because um, it's what have you done for me lately? It's quarter over quarter, operating companies, not development companies. Yeah, development's really a dirty word yeah. in, the, uh, in the realm of public company real estate because it's quarter over quarter, producing um, operating performance. Development is long-term long -term value creation. There isn't an analyst I ever met in the public markets that understood it or wanted to understand it because they're not gonna be around eight to 10 years later when the project comes to fruition and the market is just not patient enough. It's interesting that even the heads of banks lament the quarterly process of earnings, even Jamie Dimon, and having done real estate within these banks for a long time, that was the rub, that was the conflict you're doing five, 10 multi-generational planning and you're responding to CFOs and decisions that are driven by quarter. So I empathize with that. Did Madame Tussauds do a likeness of you yet? No. <laughs> we can go on a letter. We could probably spur that. If you think of uh, a mistake or mistakes you made 15 years ago, um, what would they be if you were to characterize something that you did early in your career that you wouldn't do now and you would coach younger people on your team to avoid? So I have to confess, I, I have two, I, I struggle with two things. One is um, I really don't have regrets. Mm. I, I don't look back and say I should have, would have, could have. I just don't. And um, maybe I should, but I don't. Um, I'd like to think I learned along the way, but um, I really think the whole thing was, um, liking, I had to like what I did. So there was a stint where I was uh, in real estate brokerage because there was no development going on when I left the Dinkins administration and I wanted to be with a developer. There was just nothing getting built. And I realized that um, I could not be a broker. Hmm. And it turned out that later on in my career, when I sat across some real estate brokers who are the great lifeline, you know, to getting buildings filled in New York City and, and elsewhere, hmm. I could say that I stood in their shoes. So I ended up getting some props and some cred for having suffered through 24 months, but 24 months in, I just said to myself, if I, I now know how I tick, mm. and if I don't like what I do and don't believe in what I do, I can't do it. Yeah. And I also realized I needed to be a principal. This idea of bringing people together and trying to get them to figure things out. When I was like, I can figure this out. If you guys just let me, I'll tell you exactly how, what it would look like. 
this idea of being a, a, a middleman or a go-between, it just wasn't part of my makeup. And, and part of it is know thyself. And it was then that I realized I needed to be in a principal role. Um, and that's what drove me back into the development business. And I just never had my eye on the corner office. And that's probably why I landed there. I just wasn't thinking, let me run this place. I was thinking, um, I am what I build and I just want the opportunity. And the more opportunity that was given to me, the, you know, I performed and I delivered. And it is a business where you eat what you kill. So, you know, I, I did have to deliver a pipeline of projects, but I always focused on the quality of the work. And I think there are three things I learned. The first is the, uh, the rookie, the rookie inside of us and the rookie in the room, which is to always honor the rookie. And every day recognize that we can learn something every single day. And in my, in my company, the rookie does have a place at the table because when you're in a business for decades and you're doing things exactly the same way and someone else comes in from the outside or young and thinking about things in a different way, that's where magic's made. So the rookie is a really important part of what I learned in my career along the way. The second is um, that power, the people and partnerships really power the business. And I was never a great networker. You know, I did not like rubber chicken dinners, to be honest with you. I wanted to be home with my family. Um, but as I became, um, I guess, more relevant in the industry, I would go to events, I would participate in events, but I would make connections and I would, I would invest in those connections. And when I had partnerships, I took care of those partnerships and to this day, take care of those partnerships. So great things, great buildings are built by great people and great partnerships. Mm -hmm. Really, really important. The last thing is your wheelhouse. Know your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was because I was a woman, but I, I, you know, I never got that, that email that said, uh, you're a woman, you should feel really intimidated at the table, mm -hmm. uh, be shy and you know, worry about what you say and how you say it. And that just never got to my inbox, but I can tell you why because I was part of a meritocracy. And in the business, it was the best man or woman for the job. And I think I had these blinders on where I bet you they were all thinking like, who does she think she is? She's at a table of 25 men, but I knew what my job was and I knew my stuff. And so because Bruce Ratner had my back, mm. once you're in charge, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're a woman, a man, green or yellow, people step into line if they wanna get the job done. But that requires you to be with people who have your back, people that are willing to invest in you, and that we have the confidence that we belong at the table. And so um, that comes down to knowing your stuff and being with people who value your contribution. And I'd say like people come to me for career advice and you know they're, they're looking at going to a giant firm where they can get all this borrowed prestige. And I always say, who are you gonna work for? because I would much rather see professionals in the industry coming up through the business, taking jobs with people they can invest in as mentors and leaders, even if it's a smaller operation, it doesn't matter. Like it's, it's the people you surround yourself with. So, you know, a large company working for someone you don't respect or that doesn't respect you versus a smaller company with, a, with somebody, not only that you could hitch your, your, your star to, but that really wants to see you be better than them, you know, surrounding themselves with people who are the highest caliber people with the highest integrity and lots of passion. And so the rookie, um, the, the, the power of partnerships and people and knowing your wheelhouse because you can't really fake it. I just don't think if you're substantive in this business, maybe it's because there are a lot of people that are not, but if you're substantive in this business and you know your stuff, and you are with like-minded people, it's an amazing, amazing business to be in. New York City and all that you've done and all that you're doing, what caught your eye in Baltimore? Mm -hmm. If you think of all the many cities across just the US, let alone overseas, why Baltimore? A, a little bit of happenstance um, and serendipity. So. I got a phone call from uh, somebody, a relationship I, I had when I built the New York Times building, saying that um, the founder of Under Armour, Kevin Plank, had this large project in Baltimore and wanted to know would I come and take a look at it. This is two years ago this month. And I kind of said what you said, which is, well, why Baltimore? You know, we're in New York. Do we really want to travel outside of our 
metro area. And I've thought about this a lot and my philosophy on going to other cities is that when you export the talent, it's highly inefficient and you really need boots on the ground to be good in the business. So going really far was always um, a concern of mine. Yet, if you could get there in a day or a train ride, I was willing to consider it. So Boston to, to, to DC was always on the table, but I wasn't gonna go in there as a newbie and try to figure out whether I could win a project. Um, at the same time, New York continued to get harder and harder and harder for reasons that include dysfunctional politics or tax incentives uh, to build housing, which are desperately needed and have expired. The business is tough, the city's tough. Developers are looked at in ways that are um, you know, hard to digest because of the things we talked about earlier. So this idea of going someplace else and just you know the compare and contrast, I thought you know for, uh, for a couple of visits, I can do it. So I went to Charm City and um, met Kevin Plank and realized here's, here's an individual who has over 3,000 people in Baltimore, grew the business there, could have put his business anywhere and chose Baltimore and partnered with Goldman Sachs, bought 235 acres, put 1 million square feet into the ground during the pandemic. So um, I know long beginnings and um, in our business, you know, sometimes it'll take five, 10 years before a shovel goes in the ground. That's exactly what happened with Barclays. We had $500 million invested in the project. We didn't have a single vertical building to show for it. 35 lawsuits and a decade of struggle. That is the business of large scale public private partnerships. So showing up in Baltimore and realizing they put a million square feet in the ground, they have put hundreds of millions of dollars into the project. There's a giant convener at the table that is the Dan Gilbert of Detroit. This is Kevin Plank of Baltimore, who talks about Baltimore in ways that I could never, because he's a believer. Mm. And I said to my team, only few would step into 235 acres, 14 million square feet. Um, we can do this. This is our DNA. Mm. And it comes, it's a once in a generational project. So now we need to get to know the city and figure out, does this city have what it takes? The fundamentals are unbelievable. Mm. Highly educated workforce, young population, people who like to be together. Unbelievable dirt on the waterfront, south of 95, where 46 million people pass by every day. A front door to DC that's too affordable for people to live in, and a, and a train ride to New York that's also unaffordable. And after the pandemic, people can craft their lifestyle to live in cities where maybe they go to DC once or twice a week. So when I put it all together, I thought this is, you know, this is this is really quite promising. Of course, it has its challenges. Now, Kevin Plank's whole thing is we need people to stop thinking about the wire when they think about Baltimore. And that is, of course, what the problem is, right? Mm. The crime rate in Detroit is higher than the crime rate in Baltimore, but that's not what people think. Mm. So I said to my team, this is going to be about redefining what people think about when they think about Baltimore. Mm. And it came to me that the city hadn't really come together and come up with a unified, consistent, early and often statement about Baltimore, right. yet the attributes were there. So like the big Apple campaign, you know, there, there's just, there, there's none of that there, except there's unbelievable loyalty and fealty to the city and the state of Maryland. So um, it became really um, seductive and delicious to think about doing it. And um, I spent about eight months um, negotiating. And then we stepped into a project where we picked up 22 people it was like an aqua hire and an office in Baltimore. So now um, I split my time between the cities. Um, we signed a 100,000 square foot lease um, in December with a bank uh, for office space in Baltimore, which is a market that's 13 million square feet of space, class A space. So imagine imagine like what it takes to move that needle. It's, it's not a big market, but the inner harbor of, of Baltimore is congested, is um, challenged by crime. The buildings are vintage, you know, 80s buildings are very few high performing 21st century masterpieces. And so um, I've decided that we have uh, great fundamentals, great attributes, great partners. And Kevin Plank's deal with me is that he will be the great convener. I'll do the real estate, but when I need him to pick up the phone and call a CEO um, or make a pitch, that he will do that in the way that only he can. And he has proven to be an amazing partner. And Goldman Sachs has an urban investment fund. This is exactly what their fund, their $10 billion fund is supposed to do, which is to go into cities that need some attention 
and help create opportunities for all, not for one particular segment of, of a city, but for, for all. And so we think we're giving Baltimore a little more to love with this project. And this is a project that ought to lift up everyone in Baltimore, including the six communities across the bridge for which we have a $135 million community benefits agreement that's funded and, and fully committed. That is how change happens. Is the leadership of Baltimore catching up in their messaging? Is that machine to get the word out because they have the content? The hard part's getting the content, getting the people, the ethos, the culture. Are they catching up? So again, Baltimore is not alone in this way. Um, there's been a lot of dysfunction inside of the government. Mm. There's been some issues with uh, the municipal government. It's now in the hands of, uh, of a young mayor who's, uh, who's right-minded and very decent. Um, I'm going to bet on Westmore. Uh, I came to know Westmore mm. when he was running for governor. This is a man that will bring change and possibility and excitement to the, to the state of Maryland. And he is a big believer in Baltimore and a big believer in this project. Mm. So we'll bet on politicians, some of them more than others. There are politicians for whom you're gonna do all the work and you're gonna hand over all the credit. That's totally fine. Yeah. And then there are politicians that are gonna make change and make history. And those are the ones that we're gonna rely on. And uh, this, is a, this is a decade long quest, but again, uh, you must believe in what you're doing. Um, going back to the, the Barclay Center days, I mean, there were times when it was really hard. Mm. And if you didn't fundamentally believe in what you were doing, um, this was not for the faint of heart. And so, um, you know, I, I do want to write it all down just because real estate's really a collection of, of, of stories about the human condition. And you just meet incredible characters. And I have a lot of crazy stories, not just about being a woman, but being in a business where um, sometimes the, the impossible will happen yeah. and, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So there's a lot of stories there. And I just feel so grateful and so fortunate to have had a place at the table to participate in, um, in all of that fun. When you think of, uh, you mentioned New York is getting tougher in some ways and Baltimore has been somewhat of a breath of fresh air in that way. So going forward, I guess two questions. Uh, do you see a light in the tunnel of New York City? Do you see hope on the horizon? And number two, uh, does does that circumstance here at home fix your gaze outward more than it ever would have been in the past to other cities and other breath, breaths of fresh air that you might see? So my first love is New York City and it will always be. I won't give up on it. Mm. I would say... Um, we're in some really challenging times. There's enormous possibility. When I think about the office stock and I think about how those C and B buildings are never coming back as office buildings, right? And everybody uh, is debating the merits of conversions, but we have a housing crisis. And a housing crisis in this city is defined as anything where vacancy rates are you know, 3% uh, or less. And it doesn't matter how, how hard the times are, that's where we've been consistently. Maybe it spiked after the pandemic slightly, but it was a temporal thing. And so we couldn't, we'd have to work really hard to overbuild the housing stock. And when I say the housing stock, I mean market rate housing as well as affordable, right. you know, low, middle, and moderate income housing. And so why are we debating the merits of a tax program that if anybody sat down and just took the time to look at the math would understand it is just existential to the business to have a 421A program? And we don't. Um, and I'm not sure we will. I'm not even sure we'll have an extension for the program that was in place when all of us put our footings in so that we could head back to deliver some housing between now and 2026. That is just not right. And so um, I, I really like the governor. I, uh, you know, the mayor's a, a Brooklyn guy and I, I believe in Eric Adams. Unfortunately, it's the legislature as well. And I think this pendulum has to swing. And I think all of this extreme left extreme right has has not served us well as New Yorkers. And so um, I'm a little jaded. And um, because of that, it's nice to go to Baltimore where the answer isn't no, as soon as you show up, it's yes, but don't let us down. Yes, can you deliver on what you say you wanna do? And that yes, and that possibility is, is really inspiring for, for me and my team because the work is hard. But in New York, the answer is no first. 
And I just don't think, and maybe we as an industry contributed to that by taking advantage of opportunities in ways that we talked about earlier, which is it shouldn't be that way. But uh, a city has to grow. And the kinds of things I'm talking about are, are what, what keeps a city strong and allows people who deserve to live close to the urban core, living close to the urban core. And what happens in this issue of housing is if it sustains itself and there is no program, we will have a homogeneous collection of condominiums that are highly unaffordable for people in this city. And I don't think we should want that. That's not, that's not who we are as a city. And so I just, I find it deeply troubling and I don't see uh, an end in sight. I think it has to get really hard and this chilling effect that's gonna take hold. Right now we have lenders that are also backing off of multifamily. All of this means we're in for some very, very rough times. And then when it gets rough enough, and people start to recognize the consequences of their action or inaction, maybe something will change. Does anyone see the movie you're watching when it comes to New York State and New York City? Could anyone sit with you and say, yep, I see it too, oh boy. The industry sits around and kvetches about this and we all agree with each other. Like, what is that gonna do? You know, like I, it's, I, I find myself not even wanting to be in the circles where we're all complaining about it. Um, so I don't really have the answer. I think it's about, um, yeah, what, like who, people who go into public service that are, that are amazing humans that want to bring change, mm. I worship at their altar because um, to be honest with you, like it's, it's hardcore to go into government. And someone like Jano Lieber, who's qualified to run a big piece of Larry Silverstein's empire and raises his hand and says, I, I wanna go back into government and run the MTA. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to throw all sorts of like kudos his way, but I, I mean, those are the kind of people we need to find and embrace and support and celebrate. Yeah. And you think with social media and what has spawned over the last 15 to 20 years, how much energy the form attracts away from the substance of things. It also is a, is a, a headwind for all of this is how much you're reacting Yes. to opinion and shadows and conjecture as opposed to the real issues at hand. So when I took over for, for Barclay Center and, um, and Atlantic Yards back in the mm. day, uh, I was doing everything in the company but that project, and then I was asked to, to lead it. And um, we had possession of 99.9% .9 of the properties at some point, you know, and um, that sounds really promising, right? Except that the last tenant was on center court. Mm. His name was Dan Goldstein. And when I got to the project, I thought, I'm just going to ring up Dan Goldstein because this is a guy that, that, that organized all the opposition. And again, someone in the world of academia should do the great definitive study of what technology has done to our business, where I would go to California and people would say, oh my, you're part of that project in Brooklyn where everybody hates it. And it was because you didn't know whether it was a thousand people or a million people because the organization of the opposition was so good that if you, if you sat around and parsed the data, you'd see that it's the same 10, 20 people pinging every day. But if you didn't, and you were just a, a, a citizen, you'd say, wow, everybody wants that project run out of town. But of course, we spent a lot of time with the data and we knew that by polling, 65% of the New Yorkers knew that this was about affordable housing, hoops, and jobs, right? But, but if you went anywhere outside the city or anybody who wasn't necessarily informed, um, you'd, you'd get this like, wow, I feel sorry for you working on that project. And you would have to be living under a rock not to know about the, the opposition if you lived in New York. So I take over the project and I say, I'm just gonna call up Dan Goldstein because he seems to be in the way. So I call, and the, the lawyer's like, you cannot call Dan Goldstein. And I said, why can't I call Dan Goldstein? Well, he is suing us and we've spent you know millions of dollars fighting him in court. And if you, if you see him, you have to bring a lawyer. And I said, no, I don't, because I'm going to go see him and I'm not going to do anything wrong. And this is about people. And I think I need to understand where he's coming from. So I ring up Dan Goldstein and he can't believe that I called him. And this is, this is after they put cameras up when I, the first time I toured the site after I took over on all the, the social media sites was like, you know, oh, new sheriff in town. And they commented on everything about, you know, where I walked and what I saw. It was really scary because there was just like a full spotlight on the situation. So he lived in a building, we had 35 condo units. We had bought 34 of them. There was one unit left and it was Dan's unit. And so he, 
he, he said, it has to be at my house. And I said, okay, I'll come see you thinking, you know, we own 34 of the units. We could be on the condo board together actually, because he's in this building that we bought that we can't take down because he's the last holdout. So I'm telling you this story because it really comes down to people. So I go visit him and um, he tells me I can't bring any lawyers. And I said, I, I assume that you'd say that. And we sit down at his dining room table and he just had a new a newborn baby and the baby was so cute. I did worry about my ability to be strong because the baby was just so cute. And we were talking about the project and his wife said, you need to pick this arena up and you need to put it in Coney Island. And I said, well, with all due respect, there are people in Coney Island that feel the same way about a basketball arena. Like, I'm not really sure that that's gonna fix anything. Um, and he said, well, that's, that's, that's a non-starter. And I said, you're right, it's a non-starter. We're not gonna move the arena to Coney Island. And he said, well, it's a non-starter for me if the arena stays. So we did this for like an hour and a half. And I thought, okay, now I understand. You know, he, he doesn't want the arena. And so um, I left the meeting. We were never supposed to talk about the fact that the meeting happened. And um, I then had a direct dialogue with Dan Goldstein. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not dissimilar to the day I started in economic development in the 80s when I worked in public development. And my first assignment was an industrial park in Queens where there was going to be a tow pound built and there was a squatter living on the site and they said the squatter will not leave and therefore we can't build the New York City Police Department tow pound. I thought, okay, so what do you want me to do? And they said, well, we have to figure out a way to clear the site. So I said, I'm gonna go visit him. They said, you can't go visit him. He's 82 years old, he wears a dress, he has a shotgun and two pit bulls. <laughs> so, I was like, well, why, why is he living on a, on a site in, a, in an industrial park? Well, because he's mentally disturbed. I said, okay, well, can we all just agree? Like nobody wants to live behind a chain link fence on a site that's gonna be a car tow pound. So what are we prepared to do for the guy? So I get on the train, everybody tells me you should not go to College Point. He has a shotgun, you should not visit him. And I said, I'm absolutely gonna go visit him. So I was like 22 years of age and, I, and I, what I'm telling you is I know nothing about the business. All I know is that this is a person, this is a human who has a set of facts and beliefs and preferences and desires. And I need to understand what they are. And I literally stood on the other side of this chain link fence and I talked to this you know, very disturbed older man about how we could recognize that eventually he was going to have to leave and couldn't we help him leave on his terms? And so um, I'm juxtaposing these two stories, but in the end of the day, they're really about the human condition. In the case of the squatter, we were able to get him social services and we moved him off the site. It was not a hostile situation. Dan Goldstein threatened to use handcuffs and handcuff himself to the radiator so that we had to drag him out of his apartment and instead we gave him $3 million and he left. <laughs> Such is the business. And so um, it's not boring, Res never boring. <laughs> Elegance and uh, respect goes a long way, still. <laughs> you have three children. Two. Do any of them share your passion? And if, if not, what makes their heart sing? Having lived with you and been raised by you, well, they are the reason for everything for me. So, um, you know, when I when I think about leaving my kids every day, I thought, geez, I better make it good because I really want to hang out with them. So if I have to go out and make, make a career, it should be fun and rewarding. And so um, my children are, are 23, 25, and I have uh, a daughter, two, two boys and a daughter. And my daughter's like an unbroken me. So, you know, we didn't get into like how I got where, where I got. But at the end of the day, I really functioned through dysfunction, a very disruptive, dysfunctional childhood. My father left when I was very young. Um, and um, my mother really taught us mostly by um, not doing what she did. You know, just like the, the idea that um, she wanted better for us, but didn't really have um, the same opportunity. But she did teach us one really important thing is that you make your own way you make your own happiness and you should rely on no one else to do that for you. And that turned out to be one of the most important life lessons. And so for all, all of her issues, all of her mistakes and all of her limitations, um, she, gave, she gave my sisters and I that great gift. And um, I didn't want my children to not know where their lunch money was. I didn't want my children to worry about how they were gonna get out of town and go to a college. So if anything, I redesigned the experience of, of, of what it feels like to be a child and, and went to places where economic security and um, feeling safe and loved was paramount. And I probably overdid it, to be honest, but the good news is 
that grit is um, is hereditary. So I have um, in my children a level of grit that I'm very proud of. Um, they don't um, they don't worry the same way that I think I I did, and you know was 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 a lot of my success about needing to to cut a path and and find a way to not not be concerned about my my housing, my shelter, my lifestyle, whatever it was, but my children don't have to worry about that. But that was what was most important to me was that that not be what was on their mind. So um, they're really good kids. My my oldest um, has taken real estate and turned it into an opportunity for him to create a sustainable collective uh, fashion hub of 250 national and international brands where they bring all of their goods together. He has three spaces in the Oculus in the World Trade Center. He pays no rent. He pays participations to the landlords. He throws amazing parties. He is figuring out the future of retail. And he's not doing it because he likes real estate. He is an unbelievable connector. He's 25 and he went to Davos. Um, he's just in the rooms with people where, God bless him, but it's um, a little bit of the real estate he learned at the dining room table, but um, a lot of creativity, a lot of ingenuity, and a big entrepreneurial mind. My middle is living in the metaverse, um, dealing uh, crypto and NFTs quite successfully. Um, <clears throat> a whole different business, and this could be the subject of an entirely different panel. And my daughter, again, when I say she's an unbroken me, she is a fireball. <laughs> she is, her name is Tess. I say don't mess with Tess, part sumo wrestler, part princess. Uh, she is the Emery, and she is um, really uh, amazing. And so, um, she uh, she could take care of the boys and all of us. I mean, she's just this force of nature. And so very proud of my children. And again, I, I would be lying if I, if I said to you that it wasn't really all about in the beginning, the middle and the end about them. Mm -hmm. And um, people say to me, but that's crazy. You know, you were destined to have a career. I just knew that I was always going to work. Mm -hmm. And um, I really, really love being a mother. And I, I was one of the people who was on work before I was at work. And I probably secretly, you know, figured out the work from home thing mm -hmm. by saying to Bruce, I cannot do what I do every day if I'm not able to bring my children to school or pick them up in some combination thereof. Okay. And so we had the wink and the nod where I was able to figure out my life in a way, which now is much more doable because of the pandemic. And it is one of the great, out of all that tragedy, the great gift is we know, particularly women, that you can be on work and not at work. And I was never a water cooler person. I never stuck around until the boss left and then left right after. I saw those people and I knew what they were doing. But in the end of the day, it was all about the substance and the contribution. And so I am really excited about work from the, the workplace of the future because it does have unbelievable implications for people who want to build families because you, you can have it all but you shouldn't have to sacrifice family and children to have a meaningful, deeply, deeply meaningful career. It just shouldn't be necessary. I feel like we could do a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> We're ending on a return to the office and the workplace. Um, I'm getting gestures uh, for Q and A. I okay. think we've- Only the hard ones, we've, please. We've stolen a few minutes to, and it's been lovely. Yeah, you've been great. Really lovely, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. This was really terrific. And I appreciated your emphasis on work-life balance at the end. And it made me think about the fact that it took me uh, 20 minutes to get here from the Upper East Side to the Middle West Side, taking the Q subway train. Now, if that Q didn't exist, I would have taken a taxi. It would have cost me $18 and I would be late to get here. So. Transit-oriented development is so important to me today, particularly lifestyle, and we have so many opportunities to do it in New York. Uh, I'm not going to talk about specific places. We all know where they are. But nothing happens there. These places that could be opportunities for work-life balance and lifestyle exist. We don't. We talk about them, but we don't do anything about it. Does the development community led by someone like yourself, can they form a leadership that would focus on this, get people talking about it and get things moving rather than waking up in the morning and saying, no, the latest idea. 
First of all, I agree with you on mass transit. It's the modern miracle when it works and it really does um, make a city livable. I think what happens when I think about my peers, I think that uh, it, it takes a lot to, to do what we do. And, and you know, if it's a 200,000 square foot building or a 2 million square foot building, it's almost the same amount of, of grit and work and, and lifting. I think um, it probably comes back to communities. I think that communities have a lot of leverage now. And that means that when they're resisting change, it stops it. And when they want change, it could bring it on. And so I think that all of us around this room should recognize that representing in your communities and, and speaking up and, and having a voice and running for community board seats, and it's all really important. And I would say back in the day when, um, again, communities were rolled over and this was not the right way to do it, it didn't really matter if you had a relationship at City Hall or whatever it was like. I was never part of that cabal, but I think that it, the reputation of the development community going back in the day was, was, was not helpful. But now communities have, have real voices and um, a community can make or break a project. So I think that it gets down to how do our council members work? How do communities get together? The ones that have been successful, you think about what happened in Gowanus, where there was um, re large scale resistance to the rezoning. And Brad Lander, who, who was really an anti-development person for a lot of his career, decided that he wanted to be on the forefront of making it happen. And it was, wasn't easy and it went on for longer than it should have, but it got done. So I'm gonna say to you that I wanna put the responsibility back with the voters and the community, because those are the folks that when they vote um, with what they want and what they want to see, and they're willing to stand up and say it, then you start to see people pay attention. I hate to say it because politicians are really just going to continue um, to, to do what they think is popular. And unfortunately, there's a malaise that hangs over this city, which is um, to, it's easier just not to do things than it is to do things. So that's not a great answer because I don't know if I, I there's no magic elixir. You know, sometimes it's that pendulum that really has to swing. Thank you for that. I was curious to hear your opinion on um, Hochul's new plan for affordable or housing in general, not necessarily affordable, how on the state level, she wants to kind of add more stock. And um, if you think there's any opportunity in New York City as a really small microcosm. Enormous opportunity. Um, what she and Adam say about housing is you know, spot on. And I'm a big believer. The problem is she can do none of it without the legislature. There is no ability for her to build the housing she wants to build or to renovate the housing she wants to renovate if there are no programs to support that. And those programs are voted on by the legislature. And so she needs to make a partnership with the other branch of government for there to be anything meaningful to talk about. And we all stand here tapping our toe and waiting. And this gets to this fact of like, how long will it take? And we're already on borrowed time because there is no program. So nobody's gonna buy real estate with the intention of building housing if there's no fundamental economic proposition that works. And it just doesn't work. And the part that I get frustrated about is everybody thinks developers laugh all the way to the bank. You can sit down and look at a pro forma. It's not that hard. You probably don't even have to not add. Just to be able to understand what it costs to build a building, the revenue you're gonna get, the returns associated with it, the cost of the debt, and whether it makes any sense. And developers are you know, driven by Capitalism. So, you know, they're not going to do it just because it needs to be done. They need to be given a reason. And I'm sorry to say, but that, and that's okay. And they shouldn't be um, unreasonably rewarded, but there needs to be an economic equation that works and there isn't. And that message just isn't resonating in Albany. So I, I, I support and applaud what she's doing, but what I think she really needs to do is figure out how to make a deal with the legislature to get a program that works for New York City so that we can get back to work. Got a really easy one for you. Why no the the in front of Ruby? You said you sounded like you were opposed to the the. Yeah, it's, it's a good question because even we went down to Baltimore and we rebranded down there and it's called Baltimore Peninsula. It's not called the Baltimore Peninsula. And, um, you know, it's kind of like Central Park, Barclay Center. You know, names carry a lot of weight and people can actually be trained. And I think there's a lot more power in Ruby than there is the Ruby because every other developer calls their building, you know, the, 
the something. So I think part of it is um, uh, we have the great benefit of working with really, really smart branding people. And when you brand, you do sit around like debating those things. Um, Baltimore Peninsula, Baltimore has the same number of letters as Peninsula. And so it sits beautifully right on top of the other. And so these are things, again, when we're not talking about quality of life, parking, cost of construction, issues around lending, those are the fun conversations. Hi, thank you for all your responses. They're very, very insightful. Um, earlier, you talked about some of the opportunities that came out of the pandemic, and you just touched on the cost of debt and how interest rates are rising, the current economic environment. I was wondering what opportunities you see in the current economic condition and what you're looking forward to, to either in the downturn, if there is going to be one or coming out of it. So my economic development hat immediately, you know, I go there, which is these are the times where the large scale public private partnerships should be created because we are in a downturn and these things take a long time. So government is needed now during these times more than ever. And so that's why leadership is so important. And so when you look at areas of the city that could, could really um, uh, benefit from a wholesale rezoning or a, a large scale overhaul, or let's talk about conversion, what are we gonna do with all these buildings that will never be thriving office buildings again? Mm. Um, there's a series of, of initiatives inside of zoning where they'll clear some setback requirements and distances between windows, things that will allow about 120 million square feet of office space to be converted to residential. This is like an amazing initiative. This is like the midtown rezoning of, of, of the last decade. This is not easy stuff. This is what should be happening now. Because what are we going to do if we don't, we're never going to go back to work in the same way. And we're not gonna need the same number of, um, of offices and the same square footage. So this is an opportunity to take the aging office stock in the city. Average age of an office building in New York City is over 72 years of age. So, wow, let's look at this situation and make some lemonade out of these lemons. And I think that the housing answer, and then you get a lot, a lot of people saying it's never gonna work. These buildings can't be converted. Well, here's what I know. If you have to take the whole building apart, right? It's just a question of what's the land worth. And if you have a tax program that meets you where you need to be, then you can create 24 by seven communities. Because a lot of these old buildings are located in downtown areas or places where it used to be a thriving commercial hub. And now you introduce multifamily housing where people are gonna be there living and, and working. So why don't we think about the 15 minute city, which is what Paris did under Mayor Hidalgo, which is you can get everywhere and anywhere you care about in 15 minutes. Mm. We can do this if we take the stock and we transform office stock into to, to housing. And then maybe you don't even need to get on a subway. Maybe you can take a bike path or take a stroll to your doctor's appointment, to your children's school. We can do that in this city. And that is a high quality of life proposition. We have an opportunity now because we're never going back to the world we knew before the pandemic. Mm. Okay, our last question. Thank you for that. Um, so one of the common themes of what you've been talking about is a community first uh, development perspective. Do you believe there's enough popular sentiment within the development community to support that focus of a community first versus a project first? Because it seems like within the New York metro area, you have very underserved communities in Newark, Patterson, Trenton, Camden, where the government is already in place supporting, supporting heavy redevelopment. They have subsidies, they have all of these plans in place, but one of the major issues is the perceived hair in these communities where you're really not getting um, the return you're looking for unless you're looking at a 10-year investment horizon. Do you feel that some of your peers are focused in that way, that they're really invested in the community looking to integrate? Or is there still that project first mentality where they're looking at a one-off development and not really looking at what they can do to change where they're investing in? That's a great question. So when I hear that question, I think about scale. Anybody that wants to build scale needs to understand the business, which is a partnership, a partnership that involves the community. I'm also gonna give you the bad news. You cannot build anything of meaning with complete consensus. So when you have, you know, so, so Atlantic Yards and Barclays Center, we had 532 community meetings. 
yet we were doing deals in the back room and the community wasn't involved. And I, and I reject that. And I would have to say to people, that's just simply not true. And just because you're not getting what you want doesn't mean we're not hearing you. So there's this balance between who's putting in the money, who's taking the risk, who's responsible for the execution, and then hearing people who are gonna live with the, you know, the, the consequences and the benefits of, of your actions. Right. And I think it's a really complicated equation because um, like when, when I meet with community members, I will immediately talk about the things that are possible and the things that are not possible. Um, so people will say, why can't you build more housing? Why more affordable housing, not less. I agree. So let's, let's talk about what it would take for that to happen. And so I think transparency and um, honesty, directness is, is really important. And um, that means that you've got you've to be committed to, to doing all of that and you have to be in it for the long haul. These are not quick fixes. So I think that if you are in the business of public-private partnerships and large-scale development in the communities and the opportunities that you're talking about, you better know how to do it. And it, it's not easy, it's not fun, and it's not always successful. But the faint of heart need not apply. So the people that want to build, you know, glitzy hotels and fancy condos, you can still do that in this city. You make a good living. But if you want to go into a, a, a community that's been deprived of economic opportunity, you need to be able to sit with, talk with, and connect with the communities in which you build. And it does help if you look like them. It helps if you look a little bit like them or you live where they live. You know, so I moved my family a half a mile from Barclays in the midst of building the project, in part because I could afford to live in the city with three children uh, in my career. And when I did that, it was um, both empowering and it was petrifying. Um, the, the morning I woke up when I, after I moved into my house, I drew the blinds in my daughter's bedroom and there was a giant sign hung on the back of the multifamily building behind my brownstone that said F you Marion. And they were trying to drive me out of Park Slope. Um, and I thought, my goodness, what have I done? I've, I've brought my children into this, into this, this, this you know, spiral of, of really just hate. And, and I, I would walk down the street and not know if the people on my street were friend or foe, because at the time there were the haters of Barclays and then there were the, the lovers. And um, the last thing I'll say is I have a little fantasy where like I have a low jack system where when you go into Barclays on the big screen, you know, that when the people that spent most of the time trying to stop it and hate on it, um, when they came into the arena that I would have this, this system of knowing and I could put their name up in lights and say, welcome Dan Goldstein to Barclays Center. <laughs> it's so nice to have you. But here's what I know. And the reason I can joke about it is I chose to live a half a mile from that arena. That arena is a really good neighbor. That arena did not create the traffic problems that exist. That arena pays for every bit of every impact that occurs in and around that half a mile radius. That arena looks like it possibly could have been there in the beginning of Brownstone, Brooklyn. That arena is a place where young children stroll through the streets of Brooklyn with, with shirts on with their favorite athletes on game day. That has changed the neighborhood. That arena has 50% of its employees working there who come from Brooklyn and two thirds of those from public housing. These are the things that make me believe that that arena belong there and had a reason for being there and has made Brooklyn a better place. The center of gravity for Brooklyn, when we think about it, you know, we, when we were building it, we were like, maybe it could become like the clock at Grand Central Station. All the way through George Floyd elections, protests, when you turned on the television and they were talking about Brooklyn, what do you see? Do you see Barclays? Turns out it happens to have become Town Square for Brooklyn. And for that, I am very, very proud. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we wrap up, a couple of things I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the, uh, the chair of our Executive Advisory Council of the Real Estate Institute, Ryan O'Connor, over there in the corner. And make sure you cast him um, afterwards. Because what we have planned for the Real Estate Institute is precisely to address the many of the items that were discussed today. I also want to say that, you know, Marianne was not exaggerating because one of the first things I was told when we first started doing this series by Danielle was she won't do anything with if, if it interferes with dropping her kids off at school. So we have to work around that. So it goes to show you can achieve that um, work life 
balance. Uh, Danielle also told me that I have to get Marianne here out before like four o'clock today. So try if you see her afterwards. <laughs> it's a big problem. Um, you mentioned the sequel. Maybe we'll do that. But keep it. Be, please keep on being engaged. We just had the first of our Titan talks with Barbara Corcoran, um, and we're planning future sessions with uh, similar illustrious people. And I'm going to close with a question for Michael because he asked all, all the questions. So you have no idea this was coming, right? No. So, Michael, which one of the deals that Marianne spoke about today would you, when you were in your position, you know, had global real estate at JP Morgan, would you said, no, no, that's that's a ridiculous thing. We would never entertain going anywhere near that. Well, I think, I mean, between banking, I, I, will, I will say I lived in Brooklyn for over 12 years in Bay Ridge and then the Heights um, back in the 90s. And um, so that strikes my heart, actually, knowing that community, uh, really quite beautiful. But, you know, coming back to, to Manhattan, um, the New York Times building, 42nd Street, I mean, that is a, it, it's, it's an area that has to, it, you have to get it right. New York City can't be New York City if you get certain areas wrong. Um, and that's what Jane Jacobs did downtown and so forth. And so I think um, I think you have to, to what Marianne said, you have to know the humans you're planning for. And you have to know the humans that are going to live uh, with the place that you create. And I think that spells success far beyond the balance sheet uh, and the line of profit. Um, and I think banking and every company, and I think they're having a reckoning today. Every company is starting to really think about that. Like, And I, and I think that they're... Um, they're realizing that they have, they have to get to know their workforce better than they did in the past. It's not just build it and they will come. Wait a minute, there are lives out there, uh, beautiful lives that, that are demanding flexibility. And so when I think of placemaking and I think of what you're doing in your ethos, you know, I, I pray that there are Marianne's in the world cities that I love, in the countries that I love, because Lord knows they need them. You know, it's interesting. We used to look up the CEO's address whenever we were trying to get somebody to come to Brooklyn. We'd look up the address, and if they lived in Connecticut, it would be like, oh, forget it. It's never happening. <laughs> if they lived in Brooklyn Heights, we're like, we got a shot. But what's amazing about today is what you're saying. It's all about the workforce and the talent. It doesn't matter where the CEO lives. It's the people. People vote with their feet. Mm. And so the good news, just to leave it on a wildly optimistic tear, is that um, the talent matters. It matters in the workforce. It matters where the workforce is located and where companies do business. And you are the future of the business. If this is your calling, I would say it is the best profession I could ever have imagined being in. But there's so much room for improvement. And there's so much, um, I, I don't believe there's anything uh, like work-life balance. I just call it a seesaw. So like it's every once in a while you feel like you're really doing well as a mom. You're really crushing it as a professional. And then every once in a while, they're like, wow, it's this balanced seesaw. And I feel it on both ends. The worst thing you can do is think that you can walk around with balance every day. I mean, for me, it doesn't exist. And letting myself off the hook was a really important thing. And then just striving for that seesaw. Every once in a while, there's equilibrium. And that's what you hope for. And then you do not want to wake up in 20 years and say, I've forsaken my family. What did I do? Because then you're just not, unless that's really your vibe. But I think for those of us that, that want to be uh, meaningful participants in our family life, you can do it. You just have to hold on to it and fight for it. And if people don't give it to you, then go someplace else. Because now more than ever, it's possible. Beautiful. All right, thank you.